the wilderness. All right, we're starting a series today in the book of Numbers. And don't hide your excitement there. Uh, hey, hey, there we go. All right. I didn't get one of those in the other two services. Uh, <clears throat> so not a lot of people get, get terribly you know, riled up about the book of Numbers. And I think a lot of that is due to a terrible English word for the book, Numbers. People aren't excited about Numbers. And the book is not a book just full of numbers, as it, as it would seem. Now, there are lists of numbers. There are a couple of census. I don't know what's the plural of census. Census, is that real? Why did you make that up? Uh, so there's a couple of censuses in the book of Numbers. There's list of laws and ordinances and statutes and commandments. And so people think about those things and think, well, the book is going to be boring. But um, that's not what characterizes this book. The book is better understood by its Hebrew name, which uh, is translated into into the wilderness, all right, in the wilderness, because what the book is, is really a narrative of God's people walking along in the wilderness of Sinai, of Paran, and, uh, and Kadesh, and then into the, the plains of Moab, going in toward the promised land. And all those numbers, and all the commands, and ordinances, and lists, what they are, they kind of function like if you're reading a, a book, an, a, an e-book, and they have little links where you can click on them. So you're reading the book, and then you can click on this link, and it just opens up and shows you depth to what you're reading. And that's what we see here. Every time there's a narrative section, it's accompanied by a section of law or a census, and it just kind of explodes the text in front of you and helps you to see uh, the depth and the riches of God. And this is why this is important to us today. It's because as we read through the Israelites and they're traveling through the wilderness, um, their struggles and their victories and their desire for faithfulness and their failures in faithfulness, you're going to see yourself. In Israel, we see us. And so... The fact is, every single human being, I'm not just talking about Christians, non-Christians, I'm talking about every single human being. We are all on a wilderness journey. It's called life. And every single one of us has a hope of some kind of promised land at the end of life, a heaven at the end of our life. And so the question is, as we read about these Israelites passing through their literal wilderness, is are we going to make, through, make it through the wilderness in faith? Are we going to stand strong? Are we going to make it all the way to the end? It is very, very, very consequential to your daily life, believe it or not, the book of Numbers. So y'all open with me today to Numbers chapter 1. It's there toward the beginning of the Bible, the first five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch, Penta meaning five, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers is number four, and then Deuteronomy, all written by uh, Moses all meant to be read together as one book, but we're just going through the book of Numbers here. So counting today, this sermon series is going to be 19 weeks. 19 weeks through the 36 chapters of the book of Numbers. And we're going to dig into it, and I can tell you from my study already this far, you're going to enjoy it. You're going to be amazed by it. To help us get started off on the right foot, what I want to do is, uh, you know, when you got your, your GPS, your Google Maps or whatever you use up there, and you can look and you can put your coordinates in and you can see where you're traveling, and you can just see kind of where you are right now, but you can take your fingers and you kind of squinch it up like that, and you can see the whole trip, right? You can see where you're starting and where you're ending. Well, today what we're doing right now is we're going to take the book of Numbers and we're going to kind of squinch it up, all right? Because I'm going to show you the whole road map. We're doing an overview, a high-level overview of all 36 chapters from chapter 1 to chapter 36 because I want you to see, in general, the depth of this book. I want you to see, in general, why this book applies to you and relates to everything you go, to, go through today. And uh, I want you to see that as Israel struggles, we struggle. And as Israel is victorious in the Lord, you too can be victorious in the Lord. So before we go any further, let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you for this time. 
Lord, I thank you for your word, and I pray that you would humble us before it. God, help us to see that this is not just a book. This is not just a, a collection of history, and this is certainly more than just a list of do's and don'ts. Lord, by studying and reading and understanding numbers, we understand ourselves, we understand you, and how we relate to you. Even today, God, guide us. Draw us close. Let us gaze on you and see who you are. In Christ's name, amen. If you take the book of Numbers as a whole, and if you ask certain people, you know, what's the, what's the big idea, what's the most important takeaway from the whole book, you, you could get a few different answers. I think on the top of the list of answers of what this book does and what you should most take away from this book would be to understand that your greatest blessing in this life is to know and be known by God. To know and be known by God. This is the, as a human being, this is literally the best thing you can do. Let me tell you why. All right, I'll give you an illustration. My mom, at one point, had her name announced on the Today Show. Anybody watch the Today Show? Uh, I think it was, it was one of those daytime talk shows that I don't ever watch. All right. She was, uh, her, her sister-in-law, my aunt, was there at the live taping in like New York or wherever they do it, and she was outside, and while she was outside, she was on the phone with my mom, and one of the hosts, whoever the host is of the Today Show, is Katie Couric, is that a person? Who, who does the Today Show? Anybody? Nobody? Kathy Lee, is that one of them? Okay. Somebody grabbed my aunt's phone and said, who are you talking to? And she said, well, this is my sister-in-law. And she got on the phone and she said, what's your name? She said, this is Susan. Hey, Susan, how you doing? And so my mom's name was announced on this, this TV show. Well, guess what my mom did? You can imagine. She recorded that puppy, and everybody who came over to our house for the next year had to watch it. <clears throat> she was so excited that somebody she admired knew her name and acknowledged her existence. Now, you may not care about the Today, today Show like I don't care about the Today Show, uh, but everybody here, you know, we've got people we admire, and the idea of that person or those people knowing who we are is a big deal. How much bigger of a deal is it when the, the all-present, all-knowing, all-powerful God of all the universe knows your name, and you know him, and you follow him, and you are with him? It, it literally is the greatest possible blessing that you could even conceive of, much less grasp. And that is what we see in the first 10 chapters of Numbers. It's in there. The first 10 chapters, you read through them. It, it, with, if, you, if you don't have the heart to receive God's understanding and his blessings, you would read through them and say, this is nothing but boring. But when you understand that it is God revealing himself to his people, it opens up. Let me show you what I mean. Now, we're, we're going to do very little, you know, digging into this book. Like I said, it's an overview of 36 chapters, so we just don't have time. But I do want to take just a second to look at these first two verses. Numbers 1, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tent of meeting, on the first day of the second month, in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take a census of all the congregation of the people of Israel by clans, by fathers' houses, according to the number of names, every male, head by head. This is a big deal. This is a big deal, and I'll tell you why. First of all, it's digging back into deep history. So Moses, I have already written three books of the, of the, the Pentateuch, now into Numbers 4, references the Israelites coming out of the land of Egypt. Now we understand that Israel, the nation of Israel, was captive in Egypt for 400 years. They were slaves, they were being mistreated, they were being abused. And if you know the book of Exodus, you know that God did a miraculous work and pulled this nation out of another nation. The first time and only time in history this has ever happened, um, the superpower of the world, Egypt, pulling an entire group of people out of this nation by his miraculous hand. And what was God doing when he did that? He was saying, these are my people. I know them. I am claiming them for myself. And the covenant formula there all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, I will be your God and you will be my people. 
Now, if you think about what the Israelites were doing there in Egypt, they were surrounded by what in Egypt? This is an easy question. Egyptians. <laughs> and what are Egyptians doing? They ain't worshiping God. They're worshiping everything else under the sun. False gods, which are no gods at all. And they're seeing these idols made out of stone and wood and metal. And they're guessing, what does this God think? What does this God know? What is this God like? And they can never know. You know why? Because those gods don't speak. Those gods could never tell Egyptian or Israelite who they are, what they do, what they are like. And right here in the first verse of Numbers chapter 1, what do we see? The Lord spoke. God doesn't have to do this. We take it for granted. We could never know that God exists unless he reveals himself, and that's exactly what he does. God speaks into creation. God forms creation by his word. God saves through his word, and God has spoken to them, and God has spoken to us. What a blessing that is. You know why he's done that? Because he wants us to know him. Not only does he know his people, he wants his people to know him. This is incredible. Y'all, this is incredible. I mean, this is the kind of thing you can pass over without thinking about it, but if you take two seconds to think about it, it will blow your mind for the rest of your mind, right? You can feast on this for the rest of your life. This idea that God spoke, that we would know him, that he would know us. And what does he tell Moses? Take a census. Take a census of all the people. All what people? the 70 people that he brought in to Egypt that are now thousands upon thousands upon thousands that he's brought out of Egypt. He kept his promise. He multiplied the people of Jacob, of Israel. He brought them out of Egypt and he said, I want you to number them so that you will see my faithfulness and that you will see that I am with you. And that's what God has done for us and it's unbelievable. There's a movie that came out in the early 90s. Uh, it, great plot, less great movie. I don't even think I saw the whole movie. Um, I just remember the plot. Michael Keaton was in it, and in the movie, it, he was a new dad, and he found out he had terminal cancer. And so in the early 90s, you didn't have phones. You couldn't just, you know, Instagram, Instagram everything. He took a camcorder, and he decided he was going to record everything of himself for his son to be able to later watch when he grew up and so he recorded himself doing all this stuff so that his son could know him now why why is this and it's a tear you know you watch the the previews for this movie and you're crying after 30 seconds okay it's one of those kind of movies and why would that be a big deal why would that be a big deal for that son it's because uh not because of the the two not because of the techniques this kid learned like how you can learn how to shave Learn how to walk into a room and greet somebody, look them in the eye when you shake their hand. He could learn that from anywhere. What was the big deal? It was that he was getting to know his father. His father was showing, revealing himself to his son. And, and that's what we see in the book of Numbers. So when you're going through all these commands and all these ordinances and all these numbers and all these lists, what God is doing is he's giving you a videotape of himself. So he's not just telling you about himself, he's showing you himself. He's showing you what he's like. He's showing you, this is what you wear when you come to worship me in the Old Testament, right? There's not always continuity between Old Covenant and New Covenant. But this is what it looks like to worship me. This is how I want you to sacrifice for me. This is what I want you to do with the blood of sacrifice. This is what I want you to do with the grain offering of sacrifice. This is how I want my tent of meeting, my tabernacle to look. This is who I want to serve me in the priesthood. This is how you call upon my name. This is what I'm going to look like when I reveal myself to you. It's all in there, in all these boring, mundane lists that are no longer boring and mundane to me and you because now when we read them, it's like watching that videotape of our Father showing us His character. We want to see his mannerisms we don't just care that he's teaching us how to mow the yard we want to see how did he walk when he mowed the yard you get it how, what what when he smiles does one part of his lip come up like the other part does at the same time because that's how i smile right 
How am I like my father? How am I different than my father? How does he turn a phrase? What idioms does he use when he speaks to his people? How do, what makes God angry? What makes God happy? What does, God, what does love really look like according to God? This is the stuff we get from the first 10 chapters of Numbers. So all this stuff, it, when you read it with the right heart to receive the truth of God, it is, <laughs> it'd be like, <laughs> okay, you can read somebody else's bank account, a bunch of numbers, and it might not mean anything to you. But if you're like me, you read your own bank account and you weep. <laughs> this isn't, it means something to you, right? When you belong to God, then even the most mundane picture of God that he has put before you is enough to make you hit your knees and worship. And that's what we're going to do together as we go through this book of Numbers. And I want to tell you this, because I need to make the connection from Old Testament to New Testament. This isn't just for the people of Israel. Right? I need you to see that when we are looking at Israel, we are looking at ourselves. Because God didn't only reveal himself to Israel, he also revealed himself to his church. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians 4, verse 8, Formerly, when you did not know God, there's a time when we didn't know God. That's our understanding of salvation, that we go from death to life, that we go from strangers to children. When you did not know God, you were enslaved to those who by nature are not gods. Just like in Egypt, they were enslaved to these mute, deaf hunks of wood and stone and metal. But now that you have come to know God, and look at this, or rather to be known by God, this is God speaking to you, his church. Not only do you get to know him through his revelation to you, he knows you. And we've looked at that when we went to the book of John a year ago, that God knows your name. He formed you in your mother's womb. He knows every hair on your head. He built you up. He knows every place your foot treads. He knows how hard it is for you on a Monday morning when you have to get up and go to work. He knows why your back aches. He knows why you're worried about your retirement plan. He knows what you think about your grandchildren. He knows what you deal with when you go to school. He knows your name. What a blessing. How can you turn, a back to the, turn back to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more, right? It's, it's lunacy. John 10 tells us, Jesus, from the voice of Jesus, he says in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. This is our God and we are his people. So what are we going to do? We're going to take every single inch of revelation that he has given us. We're going to take every word of the Bible and we are going to uh, treat it as precious. We're going to study it. We're going to analyze it. We're going to see just who our heavenly father is. And so when you continue to go through the book of Numbers, all chapter, chapters 1 through 10 are just good. Every, this, is, this is everybody's God that they love, right? And in number 6, we see this great promise. that It's a promise to the Israelites, and it's a promise to us because we are God's people now as well. In, in number 6, verse 24, y'all have heard this before, repeated so many times in so many different churches. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. There's a reason why today in the Christian church, so that we are not Old Testament Israel, we can quote that to one another as a promise. Because God has revealed himself to us. When his face shines upon you, you know what that means? It means you know God. What a blessing. The greatest blessing. The greatest blessing in all of history. And it's what every single human being wants. Every single one of us. We want to know who we are. We want to know that we have a purpose in this world. We want to know that we belong somewhere. I truly believe that's why uh, sports are so big. Right? We want a tribe. We, we want to plug in uh, political parties. Why are we so adamantly aligned with a political party? Because we have to say, this is who I am. These are the people who know me. These are the people I know. Uh, all kinds of things. Young people, identity issues. Everybody wants to know, who am I really? 
Uh, why do people, some people get so interested in history and their ancestry? Where am I coming from? I think this is why self-help and therapy are so big today. We want somebody to tell us who we are. Our tribe, our family, our crew, our clique. God says, here it is. It's me. I'll tell you who you are because I'm going to tell you who I am. Greatest blessing. Greatest blessing. And so we're going to go through all chapters, number, uh, chapters 1 through 10 of Numbers. And this is all the good stuff. This is the, this is the God that the people in the world like. You know, nobody has a problem with knowing God. Nobody has a problem with the idea of God knowing them. That's, that's a nice sentiment. Where the problem happens is in knowing God, you recognize that you aren't God. And the fact that you aren't God means that the real God is going to do and say some things that you don't like. And he may call you into situations that are uncomfortable for you. And he may, he may ask you to give things that you don't want to give. And he may ask you to do things that you don't want to do or go places you don't want to go. And so once we make it past Numbers 10, Numbers 11 hits us like a Mack truck running us over. Because you've got the people of God with the blessings of God pulled out of Egypt miraculously. God's people. And then in chapter 11, the very first verse we see, and the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. What are their misfortunes here? Their misfortunes are that they followed God and trusted Him to save them. And now they're mad at Him for the way He saved them. Everything goes wrong as soon as God does something that they wouldn't have done. And they turn against him. And like I told you, we see ourselves in Israel. So lest we cast dispersion on this group of people, lest we point down with our fingers upon them, let us realize that we do the exact same thing. And all the blessings that God has poured out on you, and all the blessings that God has poured out on me, we turn back and we complain to Him. How dare you? God, you gave me a body. Why didn't you make me taller? Or stronger? Or God, maybe you gave me the wrong body. You know, God, you gave me a face. Why didn't you make me prettier? You gave me a house, why wasn't it bigger? You gave me a family, why aren't they easier? You gave me a job, why am I not more fulfilled in it? God, you messed up. And that's what we see. That's what we see, a rebellion. That's the gravest mistake you can make. If the greatest blessing you can have in your life is to be known and to know God, then the gravest mistake in your life is to reject God. And that's exactly what we see from the people of Israel, and it's heartbreaking. And they start to complain against him. In chapter 11, they complain. God sent miracle bread from heaven called manna. And they said, God, we, we just don't like the way it tastes. In chapter 12, we see that God gave them a divine leader through Moses. He, he literally uh, picked Moses out, and Moses was successful in leading them out of their literal slavery. And they say, God, we don't like the way you lead us. And then we see in chapters 13 and 14, God does exactly what he promised to do to them, and he brings them to, the, to Canaan, to the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. And they said, ah, we don't really like the way we have to enter that land. We don't really want to trust you as we go in. And so this is what God does. God tells them, I'm paraphrasing here, he says, okay, Israel, you don't like the way I've provided for you with your food. You don't like the way I've led you through Moses. And you don't like the way I've kept my promise to you through Canaan. You know what? Let's just go ahead and, and, and cut to the quick. Let's get down to business. And let me go ahead and tell you what is going on here. You don't like me. You're not just rejecting my provision and my promise and my uh, my leadership you are rejecting me you don't want me and that's what it is and we look ourselves 
in the mirror and we say, you are Israel. You are unbelieving Israel. Because we love the idea of God. We love getting the blessings of God. We even love the idea of knowing God. And God says, I gave you my church. He said, I don't want to be a part of it. He says, I gave you my word in Scripture. He said, I don't want to read it. He said, I gave you my audience in prayer. He said, I don't want to spend my time doing that. I gave you the opportunity to fulfill your joy in worship together with your brothers and sisters in Christ corporately as a body. He said, I don't want to go worship. See, I gave you guidance through your life. I showed you how human beings ought to operate. I show you how you can literally be the best functioning version of yourself. And you say, I don't want to obey your commands. And God looks at you and me just like he looks at these Israelites. And he says, let me, let me be honest with you. You don't want all that because you really don't want me. You want the kingdom, you just don't want the king. That's called rebellion. It's called sin. It's called rejection of God. And what does God say to the Israelites when they said, we don't really want you? And what does God say to people today when they say, we don't really want you? He says, so be it. And as C.S. Lewis might say, God looks at us and our rebellion and says, Thy will be done. You don't want me, you don't have to have me. And our rejection of God is actually God's rejection of us. And you say, I don't like that at all. That doesn't sound like, that doesn't sound like the loving God that we talk about. God would never do it. Well, that was the Old Testament God. He was the God of wrath, not the New Testament God. The New Testament God of, that, that came in Jesus Christ, he would never say anything like that, would he? Matthew 7, verse 23, the words of Jesus Christ, and then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Get out of my sight. Matthew 8, verse 12. We could do this through the whole New Testament. I'm just giving you a couple of book, uh, chap passages from Matthew. While the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Who are the sons of the kingdom? These are people who pretended to love God, but they really just wanted his kingdom. They didn't want the king. We see in chapter 25 of Matthew, verse 41. Then he, this is the words of Jesus, then he will say to those on his left, the left, right, the enemies as opposed to the ones on the right who are with God, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devils and his angels. You know what the devil wants? The devil wants all the good things of God without having God. And so what Jesus is saying here is for the Old Testament Israelites, and for the New Testament human beings, anyone who would love to have the blessings of God without having God himself, then you deserve to sit right next to the devil in hell. It's heartbreaking. Remember, as we see Israel, we see us. So God says in Numbers 14, to Moses he tells him what he's going to do with these hard hearted rebellious unbelieving unfaithful Israelites and in verse 11 of Numbers 14 and the Lord said to Moses how long will this people despise me it didn't used to be this people it used to be my people and how long will they not believe in me despite all the signs that I've done among them I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them. And I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. So God's telling Moses, you know what? I'm tired of these people. 
They don't believe me. They don't want me. They don't care about me. They're not going to follow me. They're not faithful. They aren't going to be the nation in which I show the world my goodness. I'm going to wipe them out and start over. Moses, you can hang out with me. We'll do it together. I'll do it through you, Moses. But Moses knew the truth. Remember, Moses has already written three, of the, three other books of the Bible up to this point. Moses is the one who wrote about the promises of God to Abraham. That God said, through Abraham, I am going to bless the nations. Moses is the one who wrote uh, the promises of Noah and the promises of Adam. And, and Moses knew that God wasn't going to destroy his people. And so Moses had a, a dialogue with God telling God's promises back to God. Not that God needed convincing, but God wanted Moses to understand, and God wants me and you to understand how he has operated. And so Moses says, don't destroy these people because all the nations around will look and say, what kind of God would destroy his own people? And what was Moses doing? He was interceding. He was standing in between the wrath of God and the people who deserved God's wrath. And God said, okay, Moses, Again, God knows what's going on here. He already knew what he was going to do. But he says, okay, Moses, I hear you. I won't destroy them all. I will retain a remnant from this generation. And the rest of this generation is going to die off in the wilderness. Um, they will not enter the promised land, but the next generation will. And so for me and you, who are all so guilty of rejecting God, who are all so guilty of wanting all the good things of God without wanting God himself, what has God done? He sent us an intercessor. He sent us a mediator, right? And so Moses can speak on our behalf, and he can be the one that make us right with God. But there's a problem with that. Because if you flip over to Numbers 20, we see that Moses himself was not right with God. And we see that unbelief crept into Moses' life, and Moses himself disobeyed God and he was not allowed to enter the promised land so what was God doing with Moses the whole time God was just showing his people and showing us through his people what it looks like to have somebody uh, vouch for you before God and he's saying that's what we need that's what all of history needs is someone like Moses but someone who can do what Moses did yet without ever having any doubt without ever having disbelief without ever having sin and that is why today, here in this church, we are called Christians and not Moseans. Because guess what? All through the book of Numbers, all through history, it was always Christ. It was always Christ. Christ was always the one that was going to stand between us and God and say, for me, Josh Wooten, saved by Christ, when God looks at me and sees all my history of unbelief and all my failures and all my failure to obey, and he says, all right, I'm going to wipe that one out. He doesn't deserve to be in the promised land with me. And Jesus says, don't worry about it, God. Save him because I'm, I'm going to vouch for him. I'm going to speak for that one. And that's what Jesus Christ does for any and every human being who would turn to God in faith in Christ. You see, Jesus is all through the book of Numbers, and we're going to see this as we dig in. As we dig into this book, we're going to see that, that tabernacle, the tent of meeting that is there in the midst of God's people, that stands for Jesus. Because that's what John told us in John 1, that Christ is the dwelling place of God, and Christ is where we meet with God. And we're going to see that that miracle bread, the manna from heaven, right, that feeds not just our bodies but our souls, that Jesus in John 6 said, that miracle bread, that's me. I'm the manna from heaven. And we're going to see 1 Corinthians 10, the Apostle Paul says that rock for which this living water flows, that rock is Jesus, and the living water is Jesus as well. And we're going to see later on in Numbers when we read about how the Israelites sinned against God, and these fiery serpents came and bit them and were killing them. And, they were t and, and it, God told Moses, I want you to take a bronze serpent and put him up on a stick, on a pole, that everybody who gets bit by a serpent can look at this symbol of their sin and be saved by casting their eyes in faith on this bronze serpent. Well, what does Jesus say in, jo in John chapter 3? I am the bronze serpent. I am the one who takes the symbol of your sin upon myself, and I will be raised up on a pole, and if you look to me, you will be saved. And we see all through the number, a book of Numbers 
that Jesus, as Acts 3 tells us, he is the prophet that Israel wanted in Moses. Uh, <clears throat> what Hebrews 9 tells us that Jesus is the priest they wanted in, Ab in Aaron. And Ephesians 1 tells us that Jesus is the eternal king that Israel was looking for uh, the whole time. This is, this is our God. This is Jesus. And so, if Moses was alive today, if Joshua was alive today, if, if Caleb was alive today, if any of the faithful people of Israel were alive today, you know what they'd be called? Christians. Because they were looking for the same Christ that you and I know. And so what do we do with our unbelief? What do we do with this life? We move forward. So if our greatest blessing is to know and be known by God, our gravest mistake is to rebel against God, then the absolute best way we can spend our time, the most glorious life we can possibly have on this earth, is following God. And so after the first generation of Israelites in the wilderness were pa passed away because of their rebellion, God said, I'm taking this next generation and they are going to be my faithful generation that will indeed pass into this promised land. And understand, the promised land for us it does not stand for a greater salary, a bigger house, a better car, a nicer neighborhood, a, a nice 401k for retirement. That's not our promised land. You will not see the promised land on this earth. Your promised land is in heaven where God will welcome you in with open arms if you follow faithfully your Savior, your guide, your leader, your mediator, who is Jesus Christ. And it will not be without trouble either. Remember, we are still in the wilderness. And so we see as this second generation comes along in chapter 22, there's a testing. And there's opposition from the outside. And Balak hires uh, a sorcerer named Balaam to come and curse Israel. But he couldn't do it. Why? Because this was a faithful, faithful generation. And God was not going to allow them be, to be cursed. He was not going to curse them. So they withstood opposition from the outside, but the real danger came from the inside when sin started to creep back into their midst. But this was the faithful generation. So what did they do? They stomped it out immediately. They said, we are not going to stand for this. And so what does that mean for us as we see ourselves in Israel? We will face opposition from the outside. As we seek to be faithful Christians, and as we read about in Ephesians 6 a couple of weeks ago, that opposition is not flesh and blood. It's a spiritual opposition. And the enemy is going to use everything he can to come against us as Christians and tear us down. But as long as we stand firm in faith and belief, we will not be defeated. If you flip to the back of the book, to Revelation, guess what's there? The church. It continues on. What we have to be careful about is opposition from the inside. As we move forward following God, sin does not take a break. So individually, as a Christian, you still have the desires of your flesh welling up against you. And they're going to build up and they're going to try to, to uh, pull you away or if it, if it at least distract you and to make you forget what you're doing on this earth. And what you have to do is what we see the faithful Israelites do when they have to deal with sin. You stand up and you fight against it. And you say, I will not succumb to temptation. I will stand with my brothers and sisters. And even though I may make a mistake and I may fall, guess what? Saints fall forward. So when you fall, you get back up and you keep going toward God. You don't hide your sin. You don't excuse your sin. You repent of your sin and you move forward. And that is what we do as individual Christians. And then what do we do as the little C church here in Woodbridge, First Baptist Woodbridge, when we start to see sin make its way into this congregation? Because I can guarantee you plan A is to get us from the outside. If that doesn't work, they're going to go to plan B. And so as we see sin start to rise up among us, then we stand together arm in arm, brother and sister in Christ, and we say, we love you too much to allow you to continue in this sinful lifestyle. 
and we care for our brothers and sisters and we see when they're caught in lust or caught in anger or caught in addiction or caught in whatever it is workaholism uh you know racism or sexism or ageism or any of these kind of things that pull people down we stand and we say we're not going to allow that sin in our midst we're going to walk with you in love and in tears and in heartache and we're going to pull you out of the mire and if you find yourself completely unwilling in this sin and you will not repent and you will not turn then we are left but with no choice to treat you as a non-believer and we can't call you a part of the congregation of god because we will not allow sin to bring us down just like the israelites would not allow internal sin to bring them away from their faithfulness and so we walk forward we walk forward we walk forward we keep walking forward in perseverance so i want you to imagine Imagine that you are that first or that second generation in Israel. And I want you to imagine that you're standing there, right? You've seen, you remember when you were a kid, when you were a kid, when that first generation was brought up to the edge of Canaan and they were allowed to look and peer into the land of milk and honey, the promised land. And you remember that from when you were a kid. I saw heaven. And you have the promise of God that one day you will be able to go into heaven. What does that do for you? It allows you to walk faithfully one step in front of the other. It allows you to stand up against opposition. It allows you to fight against your own sin all the way until you are welcomed into the promised land. And that's what we will do, church. We don't leave anybody behind. No man, no woman. We go together into the promised land knowing that we have a faithful mediator in Christ who is going to see us all the way to the end. You've heard me say it before. You're going to hear me say it a lot more times. The Greek word, pantelos, to the end, to the uttermost, all the way into heaven, we persevere together. And that's why, as we dig into the 36 chapters of Numbers, we are going to enjoy it. And we're going to see the richness of God in this book. Let's pray. God, Lord, we love you. And Lord, I pray now for anyone in here who may be wrestling with the idea that, that maybe they are like unfaithful Israel. Maybe they are like these people who look into your goodness and they want what you have to offer, but they don't want you. But you have opened their eyes today, God, and they recognize that what they need more than anything is you. They need your forgiveness. They need your truth. And they need to trust in you. Lord, I pray that if anyone in here is thinking that or experiencing that in their heart right now, that you'd give them the strength to act on it, to move forward, to go from being unfaithful to faithful, to go from death to life, from unrepentance to repentance, from one of your enemies to one of your children. And Lord, I pray for those of us who do belong to you, that we would be encouraged to know you, to understand who you are, and to be known by you. And that we would dig into your word, as painful as it can be sometimes, as difficult as sometimes it can be to understand, that we would do the hard work of analyzing every piece of this great videotape that you've given us, God, of your faithfulness in the world. And we pray all this in Christ's name. As always, if you have any questions about what it means to become a Christian, to go from darkness to life, to, to, to light, to follow in Christ's name. We have people here that would love to talk to you. We have a next steps center out there in the lobby. You can talk to a pastor, an elder. Just say, I want to know more about what it means to be a Christian. Uh, if you want to know more what it means to be a, a member of First Baptist Woodbridge, go see our next steps center. If you are a member of First Baptist Woodbridge and you'd like to know what you can do more about serving here or being better plugged in or being a more faithful Christian, Guess what? Go to our Next Step Center. And now we have a time, as always, where if you'd like to pray uh, with, with one of us, if you'd like to be prayed for, um, if you'd like to come talk to us about what the Lord's doing in your life, you come as the Lord leads. We'll be down here as we sing.